This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. I was born within the brief window where operating your own website was both normal to want and possible to achieve. Everywhere I went, I kept hearing about this great new thing called the World Wide Web. It's going to change the way we get information, they said. Change the way we relate to each other. It's going to change everything. Turns out when you do an internet, you don't have a passive consumer role assigned to you. Just as you establish connections to the Google server, so can others establish connections onto you. Amen. A TCP connection is just two machines agreeing they're having a conversation by sending packets to each other over a vast interconnected network that involves undersea cables. So Discovery 1 for Childhood Me, there's nothing saying that this needs to happen in that direction. You can flip it around and it still works. At least it did when I started using the internet with dial-up. You'd plug the phone line into a modem that looked like this, the modem into a port that looked like this, and one <laughs> later, you're online. Well, one computer's online. At that point, you could give your IP address to a buddy and your two computers could talk directly. That is assuming the internet is working that day in both directions. In October 2021, Facebook did an oopsie. As a result, their servers could reach the outside world, but couldn't receive anything in response. That day, a lot of people learned that the internet isn't direct lines to one another. It's packet switching with dynamic routing that's supposed to be resilient to attacks because, well, ARPANET, Department of Defense, etc. But that also means that connection can be half broken just in one direction. And I bring this up because for a lot of us who have home internet connections, we run into a problem when we want to expose something to the internet. A problem that didn't really exist in the days of dial-up. Because dial-up's bandwidth was so limited, it didn't really make sense to share it between multiple devices. Also, using it took up the phone line. You could make calls at the same time. It was something you turned on when you needed it and off when you didn't, and that you paid per minute, just like phone calls. DSL is a game changer. It too uses existing phone lines, but this time internet traffic is encoded on a separate frequency band thanks to digital signal processors that used to be very expensive to make, but that are in the late 90s starting to get affordable thanks to advances in the manufacturing process of integrated circuits. In the DSP processing part that's, that's, that's in your average ADSL modem was unimaginable you know, 20 years ago that you would just be throwing it at this problem. Yeah. Suddenly, the internet is always on, a lot more bandwidth is available, and it starts making sense for multiple devices to share the same connection, either via Ethernet cables to a router or over Wi-Fi through an access point, which are also becoming affordable around that same time. Now, sharing the water supply line, I can imagine. Sharing electricity, sure, just don't forget fuses. But sharing the internet, how does that work? Well, it's kind of a long story. Let's talk about IP addresses. If you're making a website and you give a friend this link, they're not going to see your website. This address tells their computer to connect to itself through the loopback device. Instead of going out to some router, the packets are going to loop back inside the computer. Here's that same address as a diagram. It's 4 bytes, 32 bits total. That's what IPv4 addresses look like. But this is more than one address. It's a subnet. Slash 8 means the first 8 bits are for the network part shown in blue, the rest is the host part. All 16 plus million of these addresses are reserved for loopback as per RFC 5735, and on Linux we can use all of them. We can ping dot 2 for example. But we don't have to use ping to know that, we can use IP to show us the route. This gives us the destination IP and the source IP. That means that when connecting to a program that listens on dot two, it sees a connection from IP dot one, something that's easy to demonstrate with a bit of rust. Our loopback interface also supports IPv6. This is a slash 128, so it has a single address. Normally we'd write all eight segments as hexadecimal separated by colons, but since this address is mostly zeros, we can express that with a double colon, making it much shorter. It makes sense that our friends can't use those addresses to visit our website. The loopback interface is virtual, it's different for every computer. If we want them to be able to reach us, we must give them the address of a network interface that is connected to the internet. But how do we find that out? Well, let's think of an example website like example.org. I can visit it in my browser, so I know it's a real website. But this isn't an IP address. This is a domain name, and we only know how to route IP addresses. How do we turn one into the other? 
Oh, look, it's DNS. DNS for domain name system. If we ask for A records, we get an IPv4 address. And if we ask for quad A records, we get an IPv6 address. Let's start with IPv6 since, believe it or not, it is the simplest of the two. We can ping that address so we know that we have connectivity to it. And the latency is high enough that I suspect we're crossing an ocean there. Can we find that out for sure? Well, the whois command is able to query various databases. Here we find out that this address is part of a slash 32 block assigned to Edgecast. It says Edgecast is headquartered in Los Angeles and gives us three different AS numbers, which is kind of vague. AS means autonomous systems, the smaller networks that assemble to make up the internet. We care about these because the global routing rules define how to get packets from one autonomous system to the next is the right level of detail for us right now. Another thing we can query is MaxMind's GYP database. Unfortunately, the city field is missing and the coordinates point to the middle of the USA. So yeah, that's the problem with databases. They can be inaccurate, imprecise, and or out of date. Plus they don't tell us where the traffic actually flows. To find that out, we can perform a trace route. IP packets have a TTL field for time to live. Every hop decreases that TTL by one. And if it reaches zero, the packet is sent back, letting the sender know something went wrong. ICMP Traceroute uses this. It sets low TTLs on purpose to get messages back from every node on the path. A TTL of one will result in a time exceeded message from our next door neighbor. A TTL of two will let us know who their neighbor is. And we can keep going until we get an echo reply, which means we've traced the full route. Here's the path from my computer to example.org over IPv6. We see packet loss of up to 100% in the middle, but 0% for the destination. This is common, it just means the middle boxes are not sending back ICMP time exceeded messages. They're refusing to play with us. Unfortunately, it also means we can't tell what's happening between hops four and six. Thanks to reverse DNS, we're able to turn IP addresses into domain names so we can see traffic transiting through Cogent and then entering Edgecast. I am ready to bet that this means Paris, this means London, and this means Boston. And so we are crossing an ocean between hops eight and nine where the latency jumps from 14 to 77 milliseconds. We've seen two techniques so far, traceroute, which gives us only one of the possible paths with some nodes missing, and the whois database, which is purely informative, it is not the actual source of truth used by routers to send packets around. BGP is the border gateway protocol. SDV lets you generate cute little graphs that show paths from their autonomous system to an arbitrary address using their view of BGP rules. This is important. Not everyone has the same vision of BGP rules. There's as many versions of the truth as there are participants. Their best path is the same one as the one we saw in my trace route, but we also see alternatives through Yellow and Hurricane Electric or through France Telecom, Open Transit and NTT. So you see, the internet is such a big organic living network that it takes an empirical approach to study it. We make experiments and measurements and try to reconcile those with publicly available data sets. Note that we didn't even find out which undersea cable our traffic was going through. This is the topic of a fascinating paper I've linked in the description and which you should go read right now. Go, I'll wait. This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. While I was brainstorming ideas for the sponsored segment, I realized I can't sound excited for the whole video and then sound even more excited for the sponsored segments. The only way to make this segment stand out is for me to chill and take a minute with all of you to relax, breathe in, One minute. That's all it takes to keep your streak going on Brilliant.org. Now, I've met some people who are skeptical of the whole gamification thing. Shouldn't learning be terse and difficult and occur in the same circle with some bearded guy rehashing the same class I've been giving out for over 15 years? Hell no. That's just gatekeeping. There has never been a better time to teach yourself something. And you do want to teach yourself something, don't you? No? Jim. Jim, we got another one. I don't know how they keep finding me. What do you want to do with them? They're just, they're just sitting there waiting for the segment to end. Okay. Alright. Alright, I figured something out. Right. <laughs> no, you hang up. If you, or someone you know, wants a fun and interactive way to teach themselves something, go to brilliant.org slash faster than I'm now for a free 30-day trial of everything Brilliant has to offer. In addition, the first 200 of your friends who actually want to learn something. I am calm. Well, they're going to get the course list online. They're not that
Okay, it's your point, but the, the mm, deal was 90 happened? seconds, so I don't know what you expect me to do about it mm. now. Oh, you're back. Um, so we know I can reach that IPv6 address from this computer, but how? This route shows a next hub that's part of a slash 10 reserved by RFC 4291 for link local addresses. The link here being this white ethernet cable, hence the interface name. And it's an address I can ping from my MacBook, for example, but not from one of my servers, which is in a different country altogether. The source address for this route is associated to the correct network interface and is a public address. We can have a static file server listen on it and make requests to it from across the globe. Whois confirms this IP block is owned by Proxad. It's a slash 26. That's, that's a lot of addresses. And GeoIP gives us a very rough location for it. It's in the right region of France. Finally, our computer is clever enough to route packets through the loopback interface instead of to the router and back because, you know, it's our address. And that's where the story ends for IPv6. We get one loopback address for development, one link local address, one temporary address for privacy reasons, one stable address for serious hosting, and that's it. It's simple, it's straightforward, and it works. Niestety, jeśli chcesz, aby większość świata mogła uzyskać dostęp do twojej witryny, nadal musisz obsługiwać IPv4. This is what IPv6 sounds like to Americans who still don't have access to it. It's hard to explain the difference in scale between the IPv4 and IPv6 address spaces, so I made you a sketch to scale. The yellow dot is IPv6, and the blue dot is invisible, because IPv4 may have 4 billion addresses, but IPv6 has 340 billion, 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 billion addresses. That many. When renting a server, they tend to throw in an IPv6 slash 64, but you have to pay two bucks a month for a single IPv4 address. Even Fly, who stockpiled them like atomic warheads, has started charging for them in 2024. And yet, all the devices in my home are able to breach the internet over IPv4. I think. Let's check. To turn example.org into an IPv4 address, we ask for DNS records of type A. We can ping that address, and we have a route for it. So I guess just like before, uh, that's the router and that's the address of my computer. And so we can just listen on it, right? Okay, that works. And we can access that from the MacBook, so far so good. But we can't access it from one of my servers. This is uh, suspicious. What is this address? I think it's time for packet sniffing. Wireshark is an excellent tool for this. I will use it to find out what happens as I physically plug in my Ethernet cable into the computer. But uh, not much is happening because the cable is physically unplugged. So I'm going to plug it in if the guardian lets me through. <gasps> okay, so here's the cable. And I want to plug it in here and keep an eye on the screen as I do this because you're going to see a flood of packets come through now. Hold on, hold on, we just missed it. It happened between those two frames. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So a device that is entirely new to the network would send a DHCP discover message, but this one already had an address. So it's just asking for it back with a DHCP request message. DHCP is built on top of UDP, which is built on top of IP, which is built on top of Ethernet. Ethernet lets you send frames to any device you have the MAC address for, but we're new to this network. We don't even know the MAC address of the router. So what do we do? We send it to the broadcast address. That way, anyone on the network will hear about our DHCP request. Does this have security implications? Absolutely. Anyone on the network could just reply to our request and pretend they're the router. Luckily, no one in this household except for the cat is trying to attack me right now, so only the router responds, saying, yes, you can have this IP address for 12 hours. Please use these servers for DNS requests. Also, here's my address if you need it, and here's the subnet mask for this network. That's another way of saying it's a slash 24. And at that point, we are sure that this is not a public IPv4 address. Why? Because a slash 24 only has 256 hosts, minus one for broadcast, and there's a little more than 256 devices on the internet, isn't there? And yet, yet we are able to make requests to www.msftconnectus.com over IPv4. What the heck is going on? It is 
time for me to do the only thing I can think of to do, which is to run this Rust program that we wrote earlier on a fresh new Hetzner cloud server that has a dedicated IPv4 address I'm paying this amount per hour to have, and see which address is printed in the logs when I access it from my home. Let's effing go. So here I am on the server, minding my own business. It has a single public IPv4 address, and as promised, it's a slash 32. I've modified the program to listen on all public network interfaces, and if we try and connect it with Netcat from my computer, we're going to see that it succeeds three times in a row. Let's check back the logs from our server, and we see finally, finally, my public IPv4 address. Quick point of order, did I just dox myself? Let's find out. If we do a who is on this IP address, we find out that it is owned by Free, and the GeoIP database shows that it's in the general vicinity of Lyon in France, which is what I have on my GitHub profile, so no, it did not give you any additional information as to where I actually live. But if you do find out where I live and you want to come for a visit, please let me know about 15 minutes in advance because I like to make fresh orange juice and pancakes for all my guests. Back to our little experiments. I want to note something important here. On the client side, we always connect to the same port on the server. But on the server side, we see connections come from different ports from the client. And this is important because this is how the client can tell apart different connections going to the same address and port combination. When establishing an outgoing TCP connection, it picks a port at random from the ephemeral port range. And then that's the port this connection has. Now, because the port field in the TCP protocol is only a U16, there's only 60,000 ports, give or take. So what do you think happens if you try to establish more than 65,000 connections? Well, let's find out. Okay, so we've got everything ready. The server is on the right. It is listening on this port. I'm going to run the client and we'll see how many connections it successfully establishes before something goes wrong. So far, so good. I get a feeling it's going to fail way before we actually run out of the ports. Yeah. <laughs> address not available. Oh well, thanks for playing. I originally thought something else must have gone wrong during this demonstration because 300 ports seemed like too little, but actually that is the range configured on this Linux install on WSL2. We're all agreed, the router is definitely doing some sort of network address translation. There is something weird about our experiment though. All the ports that we see on the client side are the exact same that we see on the server side for the peer address, not the local address. But then what would happen if two of the computers on my local network established connections to the same address with the same source port? Forcing the operating system to pick a specific source port is a bit awkward, but the next best thing we can do is to have two computers open thousands and thousands of connections to my server and keep track of the exact moment my internet box is forced to switch to port address translation, also called IP masquerading. In that scenario, my box itself picked the source port and it remembered that it's meant for that different source port on that local IP address. That way both directions work from the laptop to the server and from the server back to the laptop because the box remembers the mapping. And that is the route of all, the root, it's the root of all evil. This scheme only works if my computer is the one initiating the connection to the outside world, not the other way around. If my computer was just waiting for connections on port 443, for example, it wouldn't work because it would reach my internet box. We would just say, I'm not expecting anyone and just hang up. This would prevent peer-to-peer -peer applications like voice calls from working. But the human race is ever so resourceful. And so we thought if we have two half functioning connections that work in opposite directions, can we use those to make one fully functioning connection? The answer is yes, and it's called NAT hole punching. The idea is you have both ends connect to a third party server, and that server takes note of what the actual IP addresses and port are, and it sends that information to both peers, which they can now use to actually connect to each other because there is a hole that was punched. The box remembers this mapping, is now expecting traffic on this port, everything works as expected. Sometimes. Also, most internet boxes can be configured. You can just tell the box, you know, if you get a call or you get a connection on port 443, just send it to me, I'll take care of it. And that way you can buy a domain name and set up DNS records that point to your home IP address and then you can host something from home. Ta-da! No need to rent someone else's server in the cloud. Unless your internet service provider is also doing that. <clears throat> That's right, there's nothing saying that your internet box actually needs a public IPv4 address. It could have another private IPv4 address in the network of your internet service provider. And at this point, you have two translation layers going on across three different addressing domains. And if you want to host anything from your home, you're shit out of luck. You know, this isn't the video I wanted to make. All right. I don't like explaining things for the sake of explaining things. Well, I am a man.
But the, the video I did want to make was about hosting your own stuff. And the first question I wanted to answer was why do you not want to host these things from home? And part of the answer is NAT. There's also some privacy concerns. It's not like your IP address automatically gives someone your house address, but it can lead them there if they're trying to find you. For example, if one of your devices has configured your router through UPnP to actually open some port and they are able to scan your IP address and find that open port and talk to that device, and it's an old device and it's vulnerable and they gain access to the local network and they can scan it. And by doing that, they find the MAC address of your Wi-Fi access point. And then they look up your house address in the database for MAC addresses to geolocation that Mozilla maintains. You know, it's hard to predict exactly how you're going to get pawned, but I did do a bit of homework to make sure this video was safe to put out. And uh, if I got it wrong, I always have the cyanide pill in this tooth. À l'époque où Jean sans terre d'Angleterre était le roi, Dominique, notre père, combattit les albigeois. Dominique, les cuniques s'en allaient tout simplement, routier, pauvre et chantant. En tout chemin, en tout lieu, il ne parle que du bon Dieu, il ne parle que du bon Dieu. Certains jours, un hérétique par des ronces le conduit, mais notre père Dominique, par sa joie, le convertit. Dominique, les cuniques s'en allaient tout simplement, potier, pauvre et chantant. En tout chemin, en tout lieu, il n'a pas que du bon Dieu, il n'a pas que du bon Dieu.